All right, at this time, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Locating and Managing EU Personal Data for GDPR Compliance. My name is Douglas Ribak. I'm the VP of Marketing at Spearin, and I'll be your host. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today's webinar is brought to you by Spirion, the recognized leader in accurate data discovery, automated classification, and protection of sensitive data for thousands of organizations. Our co-sponsor is InfoEdge, a San Francisco-based management consulting firm who helps organizations succeed in today's information economy by delivering cutting-edge strategic evidence-based solutions. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, with the GDPR deadline fast approaching, a lot of organizations are required to maintain new levels of insight in how they process EU citizens' personal data, uh, such as where data is located on your network and cloud environments and within third-party data processors, as well as responding to DSARs or data subject access requests, where you must share data you possess about them, and responding to data subjects right to be forgotten, where you must remove cross-referenceable personal data upon request. In this webinar, we'll get valuable insight from our esteemed panel of experts who will discuss their experiences and try to answer common questions related to GDPR, including what data types, elements, and scenarios are in scope, what approaches can be used to handle the critical data discovery and inventory step, and how GDPR efforts may fit into other enterprise compliance efforts, and lastly, once discovery and inventory are underway, where do you go from there? So at this time, I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, joining us from the San Francisco Bay Area is Colin Anderson, Global Chief Information Security Officer of Levi Strauss & Company. Welcome, Colin. Thank you. Also joining us is Todd Feynman, Founder and CEO of Spirion. Welcome, Todd. Thank you. And Scott Giordano, a highly regarded data privacy attorney with over 20 years of experience and currently a director at Robert Half Legal. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Doug. And also joining us is Justin Suisa, principal at InfoEdge and a governance risk and compliance expert. Uh, welcome, Justin. Thank you, and honored to share a panel with such a good company. Scott, we'll kick off our panel discussion on the first topic. Uh, Scott, please take it away. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Doug. First thing we're going to talk about uh, today is, is this phenomenon of wait and see uh, with respect to GDPR compliance. And um, if you look, um, there's a number of reports that have come out recently about how many organizations are not going to be ready, not going to be compliant uh, by the GDPR deadline in 2018, which is not that far away. Um, and this is uh, this problem is especially acute with um, smaller organizations that still are subject to GDPR. So I'm going to go to the panel here and ask, um, when did you get involved in GDPR compliance and why do you think so many organizations are taking, um, for lack of a better word, a wait and see approach? And um, Todd, if it's okay to start with you. Sure. Yeah, we've obviously been approached by this a lot and we've seen this as far back as a year ago. Um, around that time, people started asking the question around right to be forgotten and where's my data? We get asked that question all the time, obviously, um, because of the type of uh, software that we sell, we get asked that. But it's, it's, it's funny because a lot of customers will say to us, um, we don't know where all our data is. That's, that's the million dollar question. And then we sort of quip, you know, actually, it's not a million dollars. It's just X. But the problem is a lot of people don't know how to get a handle on where to start with GDPR. Um, data inventory is one of the first steps in preparation for GDPR so that people know where their data is. Um, obviously, people know data is located almost everywhere in the cloud, on websites, and on desktops, and file servers, and databases, etc. But where the sensitive data is that might be in compliance um, and, and have to be restricted for, again, uh, examples like right to be forgotten, are definitely challenges. Um, the data inventory and data mapping uh, preparation is a critical state. And we're seeing a lot of customers with sort of that, should I take the wait and see approach? Because they think it's a lot harder than it actually is. Um, and it probably makes more sense to hear from Colin, who's, who's started to go through this process at Levi. Um, so Colin, love to hear your thoughts. Sure, Todd. 
Yeah, I know that, you know, you, you mentioned the data piece and that obviously is, you know, an important first step. Um, we started with our effort in, in, in late 2016 and we were just, we we're talking about it. We we're trying to get our, you know, reference points in terms of where do we start? Cause that, that's a tough, that's a really tough one for a lot of organizations. Um, and when I talk to my peers today, you know, many of them, you know, A, don't think it really applies to them. They may not have operations in the EU, but I think that's a, a, a fall, fallacy um, in terms of whether or not they're in scope. And you have those people that are kind of taking the wait and see, you know, don't quite know where to start. And then I think there's also a, a good number of people that are actually starting down the path, but they started going down the path and they realized what an enormous effort it is. You know, maybe the, their data inventory, they realized that, you know, with our borderless environments, you know, data has flowed like water, you know, and it's leaked out of their environment and it's shared with all these different partners and in all these different cloud repositories. And that data inventory was a wake up call to them realizing that, oh, this is a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. And while they're moving down the path towards GDPR compliance, they're probably realizing at this point it's going to be tough. Um, and so I think that's probably, you know, when you see these metrics from Forrester and Gartner, I think a lot of people kind of fall into that ladder group where they're, they're working on it, but they don't think they're going to hit that May date. Thank you, Colin. I appreciate that. I'm going to just um, bookend this with my own experience um, because uh, being with a consulting firm, I get uh, a lot of perspective. And one interesting thing, and I'm picking up on what you just mentioned, Colin, about uh, how folks think that because they don't have operations in the EU that they're not subject to it. And really, that's not the touchstone. The touchstone is whether you're offering goods or services directly or indirectly into the EU. So, uh, you know, good example, if say that you're a university here uh, in the U.S. and you're advertising in the EU for students to come over, well, all the information you're gathering from those students before they, they hit the shore here, that's all uh, governed by GDPR. So it's very easy to think you're not, uh, you're not subject to this. And then you find out later that, gee, you are. So I think that's been um, one of the things that's, uh, that's taken uh, some organizations by surprise. So um, with that, I'm going to go to the next question. Um, and that is this idea of just starting, just getting off the ground. Um, and I'm just going to um, go, uh, I'm going to start with you, Colin, if I can. And just based on your experiences, that could be with your own organization, could be with other organizations with whom you're working. Um, how did the GDPR compliance process start in terms of, of who within was, was, was involved in it? So who owns it? Who typically funds it? Um, what kind of people make a, an effort like this successful? Mm. Well, it's a very cross-functional team. So, you know, it, it really is today driven by, you know, the IT and legal functions within our organization. IT because we're the custodians of a lot of the applications and data, um, and legal because they really are our privacy and compliance experts. So back in late 16, uh, we put together something I would, I guess, describe as a governance committee. You know, it was, it was for visibility, you know, for cross-functional support, and really to, you know, kind of secure that funding. Um, the task force leaders, you know, who are really actually doing the work, as I mentioned, are, are really IT, myself, and a couple of our privacy attorneys. Um, last year, or well, this year, pretty much, legal really owned the budget. They, they kind of got us out of the gate, kind of driving things. As we're shifting to more of a remediation and kind of cleanup, adding additional controls, maybe changing some business processes, that responsibility and funding is kind of shifting over to the IT world. And going forward into 18, it's going to be myself and my team that owns that, that GDPR budget. So I think, you know, within every organization, that's going to be a little bit different. And maybe during different phases of your, your GDPR readiness efforts or compliance efforts, whatever you want to call it, there might be different individuals that kind of take lead and accountability for getting you to a certain point in time. And we had several milestones that we wanted to accomplish. Um, Todd hit on the biggest one earlier, and that, that really is that scope, that data inventory. There's no question that that's um, where, you, in my opinion, where you need to start. You need to understand your, you know, the, the landscape, um, what you have to kind of get your arms around. Um, and then the other factor really is that cross-functional need. You know, it's not just IT and, and, and legal. You know, we've brought into our retail, marketing, e-commerce, procurement, supply chain. You know, the, the, the data that's in scope here for GDPR really crosses all these different, you know, 
organizational boundaries. And so I haven't really found an area of our business that isn't being touched by GDPR and isn't having to possibly adjust business processes or at least become a little bit more aware of and educated, what does GDPR mean to me? Um, and so there's that, been that educational effort that's required um, that really has required, you know, that cross-functional participation. So yeah, that's kind of how right. we're, we're, we're tackling it right now, if that helps. Okay, fabulous. Um, let me, Justin, let me get your perspective on this. So based on what, what you've just heard from Colin, um, has your experience been different? Has it been the same? What, uh, share with us. I mean, I think, Colin, you know, you're hitting the nail on the head with, you know, getting cross-functional support. I mean, the, this, these types of regulations touch all parts of the business, right? You want to get them engaged, right? And the more you get, get them engaged, the easier, the simpler maybe your, your, a lot of the, the things that you need to do will be, right? And you can, you can get, get them to kind of play ball. And now, I mean, if, if you've been, you know, in the industry or even more specifically IT for the last 20 plus years, I mean, you've probably become used to seeing regulation after regulation come down the pike. You know, this GDPR is not going to be the last, there'll be something next year or the year after. And, you know, the other thing I see is a, a lot of organizations, they kind of run and scramble, right? So if something comes down the pike, they, they throw a bunch, throw a project together, throw a bunch of people and resources at it, you know, do a big push to get to year zero, you know, to try to get across the compliance line and a little bit have their fingers crossed that what they've built is, sustainable into years one and two. Um, but I think some more mature organizations that I've, I've worked with, and granted, this is a little bit more difficult if you're a very, very decentralized organization, is also trying to hook into kind of an enterprise risk or enterprise compliance function, right? Which has, you know, some of that, some, some cross functionality in there as well, right? Um, and, and these organizations take a little bit of a, more of a long view across the different regulations that, you know, but almost all companies have multiple regulations um, that they have to be thinking about. Um, it's almost like taking a page out of uh, like IT service management, right? Thinking comp about compliance as uh, as a service and thinking about okay, what, how do I anticipate and intake the require uh, the the requirements that are that I need to do for this regulation and for upcoming regulations, and how on the back end do I kind of organize my people, process, and technology along commonalities that I can use across all of them to fulfill more effectively the needs of this particular one and ones that come down the pike, right? To ultimately, you know, more efficiently use your resources because this stuff is gonna keep coming and coming and coming. Excellent, Th thank you, Justin, for that perspective here. And again, I'm gonna bookend this just with my own um, experience here. What's been really interesting is that it's either been IT or internal audit that's flagged GDPR as a to-do, if you will, a compliance initiative, but then legal has either taken it over because GDPR has so many legal aspects to it, and so they wind up driving the process and bringing in every, almost every single part of the organization, um, especially HR, marketing, operations. It seems like everyone's involved. I think that's consistent uh, among all of the panelists here. So it's very interesting that ultimately, I think legal is driving this, but everyone's on board because it touches so many areas in the organization. So um, let's uh, let's go to our next topic here, uh, and this is really perspectives on uh, GDPR vis-a-vis -vis other compliance initiatives. So Justin, I'm going to start with you here. Um, let's compare GDPR compliance initiatives that you're, you know, you're in your experience vis-a-vis -vis other ones that you've worked on. It could be SOX, it could be something with the federal government, but what's, what's been your experience uh, on, on similarities and differences? Yeah, there's, there's definitely several nuances with GDPR, right? And anyone who's spent any time on this is likely uncovered. I mean, one, one area I'd like to point out briefly is, you know, the right of access, you know, rectification and the right of erasure, the right to be forgotten, um, I think is an interesting one, right? I mean, organizations, you know, tend to hoard data, right? This is, a, this is the, the, the knee-jerk reaction that companies have, right? Is they kind of gather as much as they can and, and with a lot of things, they just kind of shove it, they, you know, shove it you know, behind a closet and lock it, right? But this is, oh, this is a fundamental mind shift, right? Where there is an ask, you know, the, e, the EU, you know, regulators are saying, listen, you, you can't just like vacuum up all this data, you know, for, you know you're willy-nilly. You, you have to be thinking about the, at the record level what you have um, and folks can kind of go and ask for changes or to, to, to see it or, or to get rid of it, right? And I think, again, that's, if you're outside, especially if you're outside the public sector, I think this is a, this could be a very different way for you to, to operate and, and require you to really get your hands around the data that you've got. 
uh, know where it is and and um, and be able to to act on it uh, accordingly. Okay, fabulous. Um, Colin, your perspective on this? Sure. You know, I'm going to go a little bit down a different path here. What what I see really different about GDPR is the cultural expectations in the EU. You know that that in, that enforcement capability has been there for many years. You know if if you've been doing business in Europe, you know that the various DPAs in each country are very focused and maybe even aggressive at protecting those consumer rights. Um, and unlike many other countries out there, you know whether you're talking China, Russia, Brazil, other organizations out there that are having putting together similar requirements, their approach to it is very differently. You know, EU and the GDPR are really about putting cus consumer customer rights first. When you look at China and Russia and other countries, their purpose is very different. It's about control. It's about you know taxation. Um, they're trying to control the information flow and understand the information for very different purposes. And so with GDPR, I mean, I like you know the fact that it culturally you know what what they're doing. I, I kind of get that. Um, but what really is you know different, I think, is that they really do have the enforcement capability, and they've demonstrated their ability to really hold companies accountable for what they're doing with their, you know, data um, of their residents. So that's what I really think is different about GDPR. Okay. Um, Todd, do you want to offer uh, your perspective on this? Sure. I'll try to not be repetitive. I think, you know, one, one aspect that hasn't been touched on yet uh, that is different is, um, and there are some that are similar to this, because again, when you look at this slide, you can see there's, you know, we're getting to the point where you know, some of these compliance regulations um, are going to overlap in, in process in some area or another. But she, uh, one of the challenges is that people don't have a list of exactly what they need to find. So GDPR makes it a little bit more challenging in that you, before you could even do the data inventory, the data mapping, and the other things um, to get ready for it is you first need to take a step back, understand your business model, and say, what is sensitive to us? This also creates an interesting dynamic for how you go through the GDPR process because, you know, it's not like you can't, you know, one of the things with PCI is to find your cardholder environment. Now, it's pretty easy to understand what a cardholder environment is because it's, it's PCI data, it's credit card numbers, it's magnetic track data. Um, and for every organization, PCI data is going to pretty much have the same definition. But with GDPR, different or, organizations are going to have different definitions of what sensitive data is. And when you go through that process of having to do that data inventory, um, it doesn't end there. It's not like you're just defining what my GDPR footprint is, if you will. On an ongoing basis, and Justin touched on this, you, you have certain requirements like the right to be erased or, or, or right to be forgotten. And that means that it's not just about data discovery and knowing where everything is as you get ready for GDPR. It possibly means you have to go through a data classification effort and know where your data is, your sensitive data is, at all times. Because, you know, when Bob becomes a customer six months from now, and then a month later he says, I, I, I want to be erased. It, you don't want to have to go through and re-inventory everything because that's going to be happening on a daily basis. So GDPR is definitely changing the dynamic and it's, it is going to be more challenging, but hopefully it also adds a lot of risk management to companies that they might not be doing today. This could also be a hammer for CISOs and CIOs to say, we should be doing some of this stuff anyway. It's good for us to always know where all that sensitive data is. Also touching on what Justin said, data is kind of a liability. Everyone just vacuums all of it up and says, I'm going to keep it all. But in reality, that's a major risk waiting to happen because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when you're going to have a data breach. And when you do, you don't want 20,000 social security numbers or 143 social security numbers stolen. Or if it's defined as credit card numbers for you, um, you don't want that being the thing that leaks out the door just because you didn't have a patch on a web server. Todd, there's two things that you, you mentioned that I want to pick up on before we, we wrap up this, this section here. One is this idea there's no audit standard for GDPR. Really interesting because other compliance initiatives at this point, almost all of them have some kind of an audit standard. So you know what you have to audit against. You have an objective 
set of, of rules or indicia or what have you. Uh, we're not there yet with GDPR. And that's really makes things challenging because we're having to rely on our, our experience over the course of many years for determining whether a, a certain criteria has been met or not. Other thing that I find fascinating about this is, and again, you mentioned this earlier, is this idea of data classification as being a control um, a mechanism for, for addressing all of these different initiatives, all these different compliance requirements, because if you have a system that's built to identify and to classify information, and then to hook that into other controls, you've done everything all at once. And that really is, is at this point, I think not just a, a great idea, but perhaps um, one of the remaining ones to, to get all of these things satisfied. So with that, I wanna go to um, our next section and talk about scope uh, and, and locating data, because this is probably the number, at least number one question I get. Uh, and, and someone mentioned earlier, I think it was, uh, I think it was Justin about how organizations are, are hogs for data and they just keep accumulating and accumulating. And, and so that was my experience when I was working in the e-discovery world many years ago. And that problem's only gotten worse. And of course, now with GDPR, you have to be very good at finding data. Uh, and for purposes of data subject access requests, right to be forgotten, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's really, in many ways, required organizations to be experts at finding data. So. Um, on the strength of that, how does an organization determine what data is critical, uh, whether it's terms of the, the types of data, the data elements? And, um, and Colin, can I start with you on this? Sure. No, it, it's a good question. Um, honestly, there's, there's been a, a fair bit of debate within our organization between the legal members and myself and some of our external counsel. What really is in scope here? Um, you know, and, and the, the best example I can give really is, you know, video data. You know, most retail organizations have video cameras for loss prevention and other purposes in their stores. So is, is video in scope? Um, and if so, how can we, you know, comply with the, the right to be forgotten? How can we comply with data access requests? You know, I've got no way to identify you in my video streams. Um, you know, but what if you came into my store and said, you know, hey, I was in your store Monday, November 2nd at 12 p.m., I want you to remove my, you know, video image from all of your data. You know, so now we know, we can now identify you, but do we have the technology to actually go back over time and remove that 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 video of that individual? It's th this scope question is incredibly difficult to answer. Um there's obviously the, the obvious pieces, you know, you can look at how GDPR dev defines PII and some of those you know, more difficult things like session cookies or session IDs that could be tied back to an individual, having to bring those things into scope. I get that. But there are there are types of data that will make GDPR compliance very difficult. And that's where a lot of our debate is going on right now. Where do you start and how do you adjust your processes and controls for some of these maybe, you know, fringe cases that, you know, might not be top of mind. Um, it's a very difficult question. Sorry, I couldn't do any better for you. <laughs> no, I, I think, I think yeah, that's that, 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 that Todd, go ahead. Yeah, and Scott, I can jump in on that because, um, you know, uh, <laughs> it, you have to draw the line somewhere. And, and it's funny, you know, I'm, I'm not supposed to say our software doesn't do anything. Uh, that, that doesn't. I'm not a good salesman if, if I say, yep, we don't do that. But the truth is we, we can't help Colin uh, do facial recognition inside video images that they have to keep for other legal purposes and have them ident you know, cross-reference that to Active Directory or a customer list or something like that. But for other companies out there that you know, are navigating what that line is, there are absolutely tools and solutions that help. We, you know, I, I was saying, you know, with the quip earlier, you know, we get that question like it's impossible for us to be able to locate all of our sensitive data. We have employees that put data in the cloud. Sometimes they put it, you know, in Dropbox and Box and Azure and all these other places. And then there's database and websites. And, you know, the list is so long and people think it is such an enormous effort. But the truth is it isn't. There are tools that help. Um, and, and most organizations are going to have to pick and choose what's the right tool for them. Are they going to have to go to the extreme and make sure they have a solution that can do facial recognition of video data? Or are they going to go to the opposite extreme and say, you know what, I'm going to download a free copy of Power Grep and search for all nine digit numbers and call those SSNs. I'm going to search for all 16 digit numbers, maybe with or without dashes in between and call them credit card numbers. Um, 
we, we, we actually had a customer, Cornell University, that used to actually develop a tool that was far more enhanced than PowerGraph, but it, it, is sent, it was called Cornell Spider, and it crawled through your system, and it identified things with a regular expression. And there's a lot of programs out there that will tell you they can do data discovery and data classification and all that stuff, but behind the scenes, it's mostly a regular expression. That might be good enough. It might be. For most organizations, it does lead to way too many false positives, and then your problem gets even bigger. Because now when somebody says, I want the right to be forgotten, you have to go through and you're going to see that with all these false positives included, there are thousands of files, when in reality it might only be 10. So tools can definitely help, but there's no question you know, each organization is going to make a decision. Do I want to, you know, do I want to download something for free? Do I want to spend a thousand dollars? Do I want to spend a hundred thousand dollars? Do I want to spend, you know, five million dollars? And you obviously have to work with the board or executive management and at, at legal counsel, internal, external, and figure out what that is. But no one's no one's saying this is easy. It's just that there are solutions out there can help, out there that can help, and it's going to come down to what's, you know. Spending the time to figure out what sensitive data is to you and then, therefore, which solutions will be right for you to locate all of that data on an ongoing basis. Um, Todd, before I close out, I want to give Justin a, a chance to chime in here. So, Justin, do you, do you have anything you wanted to mention based on your experience? Um, yeah, I think, you know, my advice, I think, is continue to do some of the things that we're doing here, right? Talk to, talk to your peers, kind of see, look at these use cases per what Colin was talking about. Um, and then building off, I think, Todd, what, you, what you're saying, um, you know, there are the right, definitely the right tools for the right job. And, you know, in order to make it effective, you got to think, you got you to get some of your the underlying foundational pieces in order around process and around data classification, right? Tying all that together will help, will help you move the needle in the right direction, I think. Okay. Um, just a, a, a perspective, again, based upon my, my experience. Um, what's interesting about finding data is defining it. And, and I know that you guys have covered this in, in one form or fashion, but just the idea of online identifiers and how tough that can be because any, any device that uh, is powered by electricity, shall we say, produces identifiable online uh, information. So think about something very subtle like a, a programmable inventory your, uh, uh, your network for software to determine whether you have enough licenses for everyone involved. Well, that's going to use your, your, your user ID, okay, from, from Active Directory. Well, guess what? That user ID, that's personal data. Uh, most folks I talk to don't realize that. And that makes the challenge that much tougher of getting people to understand just what qualifies as personal data. If you simply send them a survey and say, give me a list of all the personal data you have under your control, I guarantee that would not have come up. So everyone has to be educated first before you could even have a meaningful discussion. So again, this is just based on, on my own experience. Um, I'm going to switch gears once more. Let's talk about DSARS or data subject access requests. Um, fascinating story um, I want to share with, with the audience here. Um, there's a certain a dating app out there. I'm using the word dating in air quotes here that you can't see. There's a dating app out there that's well known. Someone did a data subject access request to the purveyors of the app, they got back an 800-page report. So evidently, the, the person involved had been pretty uh, up to all kinds of things uh, uh, on this app. And so it begs the question, uh, how do you, and I'm to the panel here, and I'll start with you, Colin, in terms of getting the information you need for a data subject access request, um, how do you approach that? Yeah, so we, we started with our CMDB. Fortunately, we have one. Um, we started there, and then we basically did some basic interviews of you know these key functions to understand better how we are collecting, where we're storing, and just kind of confirm some of the data points that we had. Now we wanted to try to zero in on the scope a little bit to because to Todd's earlier point, once you have a target, there are tools that can help absolutely. So we but we needed that starting point. I mean, like the, the, those target systems that we wanted to investigate for PII. Once we had that, we can start mapping it, you know, and you know, now I'd say nine months into our, our GDPR readiness efforts, we have, you know, those, those data maps created. We, we can kind of understand the, the repositories 
We see that where the data is flowing, which partners we're sharing it with. And so now we have the ability, in, in, in some cases, not every case yet, to actually respond to a, to a DSAR. Um, but 12 months ago, um, we would have been scrambling, no question about it. We would have probably been able to answer the question 50% accurately. We knew where some of the data was, but until we really went through that discovery and that mapping exercise, and we leveraged tools to confirm which repositories had this data and which repositories didn't, um, we had that starting point, and now we're operationalizing these tools and these processes. So because, obviously, we've mentioned this is an ongoing thing, you know, and data will flow. It will move. And your repositories and locations of PII today may be different in a few months. And so your ability to kind of keep that inventory accurate is going to be very important going forward. But for us, we needed a good starting point, and then we needed processes to start to for lack of a better term, stop the bleeding and kind of keep that inventory as accurate as we could. So that's kind of how we approached it and kind of where we're at. Okay, excellent. Um, Justin, I want to get your commentary and then I'm going to hand off to you for uh, for the next section. So uh, would you um, comment on what, uh, what Colin just mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think to answer this question about, you know, techniques um, to kind of handle this, so you could probably we could probably spend a whole freaking all day workshop just on this topic alone, right? Um, but I'll, I'll, you know, drawing from a little bit of experience actually right now, um, uh, one concept, so one concept I like and I'm starting to see more of, it's a little bit adopted from what I've seen in the PCI world, right? Where, you know, organizations, you know, um, one of the ways they tackled PCI was they centralized their payment processing, right? Into kind of a payment vault or, or tokenization vault, right? which allowed them to reduce their attack surface, right? Uh, uh, reduce the scope of where they had to apply controls. Um, and even, you know, this is like almost like the holy grail of compliance. They got some business value out of their compliance efforts, right? In the sense of they were able to better, you know, with centra centralizing their, their, their backend processing, they're able to better negotiate um, rates and things with, the, with their acquiring banks and whatnot. Um, and I'm, I'm starting to see organizations, in fact, I'm at one right now that's thinking about, hey, can we apply the same concept, but in this in this world of, of PII and privacy, right? Um, and so they're actually undergoing uh, a, a big financial services organization. They're centralizing a lot of their customer data, right, into uh, a, uh, almost like a customer vault. It's going to be a, a single system of record, right, which will give them, from a business value perspective, will give them much better intelligence um, on their customers, right? You know, data is king today, right? So it'll help them do that as well as ideally make it a little bit simpler, uh, not easier necessarily, but simpler uh, to try to go after some of these, um, you know, access requests and, and, and right to be forgotten requests, right? Um, and, in, you know, even going beyond that, looking at opportunities to, you know, to mask or de-identify that data for uses around other parts of the organization, right? Granted, it won't fit every use case and column gave some interesting esoteric ones that are definitely out there, right? That you're not much, you, there's, there's not much that you may be able to centralize around that, but um, it'll still go a long way. So I wanted to point that one out. Um, and th Scott, thank you for, for passing the baton. I'll, I'll, I'll roll with it if you're giving it to me. Um, you, you know, I, I think at this point, you know, we, we've talked a lot about, um, uh, you know, techniques and, and, and benefits um, and, and, and good practice. And I, I want to see if we can, Give you know give to our attendees something a little bit more more concrete. So I have a question for my my final panelists. Maybe starting with you, Colin. You know we, we've talked about you know the types of support you want to garner and, and garnering it early on. And we've we've talked about you know, you know data discovery and inventory and responding to these DSARs. You know what you're kind of in a good position here. You know which I think some of our attendees, especially maybe overseas, might be. They've been working on this for a while. What does the what does the kind of the, the road to May 2018 look like from here? What are kind of some key milestones and stepping stones on that path to, to compliance for you guys? Well, when, when you start with a premise, you know, um, you know, privacy by design, you know, that, that, that approach kind of really needs to permeate every part of your business. And so, you know, wh whether it be, you know, we've talked about inventory, the importance there. We've talked about making this a cross-functional effort. Um, but I think a couple of things that we haven't really talked on, touched on really much is, you know, maybe those, those contracts and your partners that you're working with, because in 
I don't know of any organization that probably doesn't have a very distributed way of delivering business services where they're sharing, um, you know, in scope data with, you know, if you're, if you're looking at HR data, you're sharing with payroll providers, benefit providers, et cetera. And so in many cases, you're going to be dependent on their partner's capabilities to respond to some of these subject access requests. So I think, you know, one of the things that we're working on right now is to kind of look at those vendor contracts and try to work with our partners to understand their capabilities. Are they in a position to help us respond um, should we get that, you know, that request? The other thing is, you know, for, for many years now, we've actually been looking at our partners from a, through a security lens, kind of doing that vendor risk assessment, just understanding the controls that these partners have in place. But now we're having to expand that to the privacy. So, and, and with a PIA process. And so, again, we're having to update our governance processes. You know, as we bring in new partners, we start a new project with, you know, maybe an existing partner or a new partner. We're having to now identify, do we need to do a PIA for these partners to understand their privacy capabilities? So, I mean, it's, as you kind of peel the onion here on GDPR, you know, it, it absolutely starts with scope, you know, kind of maybe, or, or to your point earlier, reducing that, that landscape of data. Um, but once you kind of get that under your, your belt and you're moving forward, there are so many other things that you have to do. I mean, even consent, you know, for many years, you know, you, you go to, you put your email into address or your create a user ID on a website and you're, you're asked to, you know, kind of do a check consent, consent to be contacted, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, with GDPR now, it has to be much more granular. We have to understand how do our customers or our consumers want to be contacted? Is email okay? Is email not okay? Is phone call or mailer okay? You know, there's so much more granularity that's required here for our marketing teams with GDPR that, you know, we're just kind of trying to understand how do we change our, our go to market, so to speak? How do we change that interaction with our consumers so we don't alienate them, but at the same time, we don't, you know, run afoul of what GDPR requires. So there's, there's several things that I, there that I mentioned that I think, you know, warrant, you know, putting on people's radars because it's not just about the inventory piece. There's so much more downstream that you need to be aware of. Yeah, I mean, that, excellent point. I mean, I really like the thought of, you know, it's not just about getting your own house in order, but you know, there's so many, you know, cro you know inner business connections, communication service providers, that, that third party environment is huge, right? And you start, start kind of having to go down those paths. That's yet a whole other body of work that you need to be thinking about. Uh, Todd, Todd what, do, what do you see on, on your end with your customers? Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, Kotlin definitely touched on the biggest aspects. I'll, I'll just sort of uh, shine the spotlight on some of the things he said in that it, it is all about the scope, right? These third-party data processors and other third parties that you're working with, understanding whether or not you're going to have to do a privacy impact assessment for them and what, how involved that's going to be is, is definitely going to help you understand the budget and the timing and the process for, for going through this whole thing. It's, it's scary when you don't go through that process up front and you just start to look at it from the beginning. It, it looks like it's a mountain. It looks like it's Mount Everest that you have to climb or, or bigger. And, you know, understanding where that data is will give you more reassurance. It's, some of this is definitely challenging, but it's not as hard as you think. And there are people out there who can help. Um, that's, you know, these, there are people who are experts, legal firms, consulting companies. That's, that's why this panel was formed so that you had a sort of a diverse view, um, from across the different organizations out there. But going through that process will actually give you a lot of sanity. You're going to walk into this process and you're going to say, this, this is impossible. This is a disaster. We're never going to get through this. It's ridiculous. And then as you start it, you're going to realize this is manageable we can do this. It's, it's, a lot, it's going to be a lot of work, but it's absolutely doable. Um, so yeah, I would just, you know, I would encourage people, you know, go through, figure out that scope, understand your third parties, do the data mapping, understand where data goes. If sensitive, sensitive data is not going to that third party data processor, and it's just other information that's potentially public, um, great, you've eliminated them from the scope. Um, and then you just have to make sure that you don't start sending them sensitive data in the future, which again, data classification can help with. And then from an internal perspective, yeah, there's, there's data everywhere, structured locations, unstructured locations, 
And doing that data inventory will help you gain a little more sanity as you walk into this process. So that's that's definitely a big, big upfront piece. Yeah, I, I like it. it. Sounds like it's almost like my, my, my workout routine. I'm like, okay, Justin, like, just get in the gym clothes, get down to the gym and, and start making progress, right? I mean, I think the same thing here with, with our, own, our own hygiene. You, 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 it's not, it's a big problem when you look at it all in one shot, but you start to break into smaller manageable chunks. Um, you can definitely start to make progress. Uh, Scott, what, what are your thoughts? Well, you know what's interesting is, uh, is uh, Todd just uh, touched upon uh, DPIAs, and um, I've been inundated in the last two weeks with requests for help for DPIAs. And in fact, I kicked off a project yesterday. So I think what's interesting is, is that both DPIAs and third parties, uh, the contracts and so forth that uh, everyone's mentioned already, uh, that's all rooted in a successful data inventory. If you have a strong data inventory, if you've really gone through and identified all the correct elements and, and with whom they're connected and who has access and how they're being protected, you've put together a, a really strong foundation. So I think I would just conclude at least this section here by, by saying that if you get that data inventory done, it will feed into so many other things. It will support your third-party compliance. But keep in mind, if your third parties aren't compliant, then neither are you. Um, and then same thing for DPIA. That data inventory will support the DPIA. It will give you a leg up on determining how much more work needs to be done, whether you have to go to the Data Protection Authority and get permission, and so on and so forth. So those are all integral in completing the project uh, compliance on time. Yeah, well, very, very good points. Um, and, you know, we're, we're coming up to our 45-minute mark, and we want to definitely leave some time for questions. So if you're an attendee, you know, please ask your questions. We'll, we'll try to answer them. But I do have one more for the panel here, um, especially, you know, especially for uh, the attendees who, who are still with us. You know, what are maybe two to three, you know, knowledge nuggets or, or, or key lessons learned that you guys have had so far? I mean, what, what do you wish you kind of knew sooner that we haven't already talked about? Uh, or what what, are, what additional steps might you recommend for someone who's kind of embarking on this? And again, Colin, you know, you're in the thick of it. I'd love to start with you. Sure. Well, we've, we've touched on a lot of it. You know, obviously the inventory piece, the cross-functional aspect, we've really hit on, you know, PIAs, all that kind of stuff. So I don't want to maybe touch on it. Let me focus on items that we, we might not have touched on it, it, as well yet. So top of mind, um, with that cross-functional effort, there's an education component. You know, it can't be all or only the IT organization or the audit organization or the legal organization driving GDPR. This has to be embedded into your organization. So finding the right content and working to educate your organization, all of those different you know, functional areas, whether it be HR, marketing, e-commerce that are touching this data that's in scope, they really need to be educated to what, what is their role? What are they accountable to do? So they understand and can support organizational data governance or even more specific GDPR um, process requirements. So the education piece, I think, is one of those things that we've um, started to work on and we've actually realized that finding good content is tough. Um, there's not a lot of content out there because this is so new to everybody. Um, I can tell you the, the one area that we did find, the one partner that we did find some good content that we're planning to leverage is IAPP. So the International Association of Privacy Professionals have actually created some pretty good GDPR training content um, for different audiences. I would highly recommend people kind of check that out. Um, so you know, let, let me stop there. Oh, let me add one other thing, actually. You know, the other thing would be prioritization and focus. This is a big piece. This is, can be a very big project. You know, we mentioned that kind of you just need to start and realize that it's not so difficult. But I would encourage you to prioritize where you start. You know, focus on those areas that are high touch with the consumer, you know, the marketing, the e-commerce, maybe the HR areas. There's no doubt that those functional areas are probably the ones that are at greatest risk of non-compliance to GDPR. So I would encourage you to kind of prioritize your effort and start with those higher risk areas first. I'll leave it at that. Fantastic. Um, Todd, what, what do you think? Yeah, so I'll, I'll tie back to the... Uh, the old the age old adage of people process technology referenced earlier on the call, um, I think by you, Justin, but um, something we're all very familiar with. Make sure you have the right people, right? This GDPR is, is new to your organization. You, you can't just add it to what everybody else is getting done and think you have enough resources. So 
you know, this is definitely something that needs to be budgeted appropriately. You're going to need people that, that dedicate time to this. It's, it's going to be hard to do if, if you think you can do it with just everybody you have today pre-GDPR. There's going to be a lot of interviews going around. There's going to be a lot of questions and answers, which brings us to sort of process. Um, you're probably going to need external help, whether that's um, consulting, managed consulting, or it's um, uh, legal um and those those people are going to be experts they're doing it for 20 other organizations um they're designing best practices around this to help you streamline the process and then technology pick the right one um don't pick the 10 million dollar one don't pick the one dollar one somewhere in between is definitely going to be the right fit for you if you do it wrong and you automate this whole process and it's rife with false positives your problem is going to be far worse um, than, than having done nothing at all. Um, being able to rely on the data and have visibility into it is going to be absolutely critical. So um, pick, pick wisely. Um, and again, use your people and processes to, to help you go through that effort. Great. Scott, what about you? Um, the one thing I'd love to leave everyone with is this idea of developing your critical path. So that's the minimum amount of tasks you need to do to, to get the project done. And if any one of those gets delayed, the project gets delayed. So, for example, works councils, you've got to involve them now because if you involve them later, they may either veto the whole thing or, or put up a fight and it's going to delay it that much longer. Uh, working with your third parties, I mentioned earlier that a lot of them can uh, be behind in compliance. And so you may need to um, encourage them to get their ducks in a row. So all those tasks, it's so important to lay out now. I can, I can tell you in the past, I've been halfway through the project and really realize, gee, I wish I had asked so-and-so six months ago about something, um, I wouldn't be delayed now. So uh, take that as, as uh, just an opportunity to uh, make sure you get your critical path down now so you don't get those surprises like I did. Yeah, I mean, that's great. Uh, I, I, tough for me to add on top of, you know, such great insight. Um, I've definitely learned a few things myself. I, I, I think um, I would, to close off, I think I would add, you know, what many of the attendees you know here today um, are doing, I think, is the right thing, right? Let let's. This is new, you know. Let's we're, we're all kind of learning together. I think, as Collins mentioned, um, you know, you talk to your peers, you know, join these webinars, you know, contribute contribute your insights as you learn them yourself. Um, and it'll be, I think, it'll be an interesting road to watch, right? Like, just like any new regulation, you know, as the kind of deadline approaches, and then we go into the first year, you start to really see, you know, how the regulators actually react to different use cases, right? And it's just like, you know, just like in the legal world, you know, what what what, what precedents get set um, in in the court systems, right? And and you know, we'll, I expect, you know, we'll definitely see them, you know, start, and they've pretty much told us, right? They start with kind of the big boys, right? You know, you know the search engines, you know, like, like Google. Um, you know, social networks, you know, like Facebook and these types of things. But they'll, they're, they're, they've made no secret that they're, they're, they're very sensitive right now across the board. So don't think you can kind of sneak under that radar for, for too long, right? Um, that, that's my thought. Doug, I'll kick it to you. So I want to ask each of our panelists, uh, what are the top key lessons that you would summarize anywhere from one to three? We could start with Colin, uh, then switch to Todd, Scott, and Justin. Top three, all right. Um, one, you've got to understand your scope. Get that data inventory done first. Two, make this a cross-functional effort. Um, it really does require people across your organization. And three, don't go it alone. Um, bring in the right tools, the right advisors to help you kind of navigate your path to um, compliance. I'll leave it at those three. Um. So I think one of the frustrations we hear from our customers is, is trying to use something you probably already own to do a new job like data discovery, data classification. There are products that um, can bundle that type of stuff in, but they're not, they're not best of breed. And they might not even be best of suite, but the idea is um, they're bundling in something like a regular expression or some sort of fingerprinting type thing to do it. And that's just not going to work. Um, and then I think the second one is take advantage of this opportunity. If someone's going to, you know, if this compliance is going to make you spend money, try to focus on how it helps you manage risk also. Don't just do it for GDPR and definitely don't do the minimum to get GDPR done. Take advantage of this opportunity and help your organization minimize data leaks on a go forward basis. 
I'm going to amplify on what Todd just said. You do not, not make this a check the box exercise. Really dig in and use this as an opportunity to, to make great changes that you wouldn't have been able to make otherwise. Um, uh, the, the time is now. Um, you know, I, I, I want to. I think most of mine have been said, but I want to underline them again. You know, getting that <clears throat> cross-functional support, especially from the different as aspects of the business, will help you shortcut your your path to to, to the finish line there. Um, you know, think about, like as Todd mentioned, think about people, process, and technology. You kind of want all three of those, you know, firing all cylinders. Um, otherwise, you know, your little your three-legged table will fall over. And I, I cannot, you know, again, to both Todd and Scott, your points, cannot underline enough, you know, you know, compliance, don't let compliance, you know, lead, lead you, you know, let risk drive what your, your decision making, right? Where, where compliance or regulatory risk is just a, an aspect or a facet of that, right? That is, that is critical. Otherwise, you'll always be behind the wheel. Excellent. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have quite a few questions queued up. Uh, we have about 10 minutes worth of questions, so I'll just go ahead and start firing them off. The very first question came early in the webinar. This participant's asking if the definition of sensitive data, is it really clearly understood? Uh, Doug, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this one. Absolutely, it's understood. You've got three big buckets of sensitive data. You've got regular data that we all would presume is, 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 is sensitive. So names, addresses, social security numbers, passports, et cetera. You've got online identifiers like MAC addresses, IP addresses, log files, and then you've got uh, what, the, what the EU calls special data, things like uh, healthcare information, religious preferences, trading and membership, all those things. So we already have that. It's a question really of, of finding it. Okay, great, thanks. Um, another person asks, if my organization is compliant with ISO IC 27001 or NIST 853 or SSAE 16, what do I have to do differently? And, and there are some other regulatory requirements that other organizations may have met. So the question is, what do organizations have to do differently? Let me try to take that one. So, you know, th th there are many organizations that are compliant to a lot of existing, you know, whether they be privacy um, or data center or security requirements. GDPR is a little bit different here. You know, I mean, the, the concept of privacy by design goes far beyond, I think, an SSAE 16 or, a, you know, ISO certification. Those don't really focus on what the GDPR is after in terms of um, putting the consumer first. So, I, you might have your data inventory, you might have a lot of the building blocks you need, those, the right controls in place, but none of those requirements talk about the ability to respond to a DSAR, you know, if a consumer asks the right to be forgotten, or what information do you have of me? None of those controls really talk to that ability of, a, of an organization to do that. And none of those controls also really talk to the, the concept of, you know, data governance, you know, understanding how you're collecting it, how its information is being used. Those controls really talk about how you're protecting the data, not necessarily how it's being used or how it's being collected. So there's a lot of things um, that GDPR would require beyond those certifications today. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add, um, you know, GDPR is coming at it from a privacy perspective, right? Um, not not purely a, an information security perspective, and you know there there's nuances or differences there, um, and you know I think Colin you you've mentioned that there's a lot of things get driven out of you know your privacy office and your legal teams. And Scott, no no offense to you, I was, but I was talking to uh, a client earlier today of mine, and he was mentioning you're trying to get all all our lawyers on the same page of what to do here has been has been tough, right? Um, so there's going to be a little bit of different stakeholders here. Um, and a little bit different concept to think about from a privacy perspective, but I do like for the, the person who asked the question that you know you're 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 digging into industry standards and seeing again how do I get commonalities from what I'm doing today and just extending the delta into what I need to do um, for GDPR. I think that's the right way to think about it. Great, thanks. I'll move to the next question. Is there a list of steps to be followed in order to comply with GDPR? Colin, you had made reference to the IAPP. There are a number of frameworks. What we'll do is I'll aggregate um, the recommendations, put that in an email and share that with everybody. Someone was asking, isn't the DPIA an audit in GDPR? We, we focused a lot on data inventory and map during the initial stages of the GDPR journey, continuously monitoring sensitive data 
and reporting on going risk uh, later after the GDPR deadline. In the context of, isn't there a DPIA audit? Are there other critical steps that you would recommend? Doug, let me, let me uh, take... Yeah, okay, go ahead. Let me, let me take that one. Um, a DPIA can be an audit or it could be an assessment, it depends at what point you're doing it. But that is, is above and apart from monitoring, which is, is crucial because you have to have an early warning system to determine, uh, for example, if someone is trying to access uh, data in a way that, that's against your data classification policy. So two separate issues, but they're, they're, they're closely related because if the DPIA has indicated that that's a problem, then ultimately you'll have to mitigate that risk. And if it's not mitigatable, then you would have to go to the Data Protection Authority and indicate that as such. Yeah, I, I was going to chime in. You know, I, I personally don't really view the, the DPIA as an audit. It's much, much more of an assessment, and that's kind of how we're focused on it. I'm not aware of, you know, any sort of audit standards um, or compliance, you know, checkmark that's really been developed for GDPR yet. So as we in, integrate the, the, the PIA or the DPIA into our, our governance process, we're viewing it much more of an assessment step to understand um, if there is risk, if there is privacy concern with a specific project, partner, or tool that we're using. Okay, great. Well, we're at the, actually at the top of the hour, and there's approximately uh, 10 questions left. Um, so I apologize. We will address your questions by email. Again, I'd like to thank all our panelists. Our contact information is on this uh, last slide. Please visit us and to learn more, or please reach out to me personally if you have any further questions or requests. Thank you again.